So they, uh, today I'm going to talk about the uh, Holy Spirit. And um, I'm going to give a couple of testimonies of things that God's done in my life through the Holy Spirit. And uh, yeah, I hope it will encourage you. So Lord, thanks, thank you again for this opportunity to come and worship you. Lord, just help us as we listen to your word and Lord, uh, speak to each person. Lord, give each person a touch from you today. Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to read from. Uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to read from verse 4. So that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12 from verse 4. Now there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit gives them. Also, there are different ways of serving, but it is the same Lord being served. And there are different ways of working, but it is, it is the same God working there in, all of one, in everyone. Moreover, to each person is given the particular manifestation of the Spirit that will be for the common good. To one, through the Spirit, is given a word of wisdom. To another, a word of knowledge, in accordance with the same Spirit. To another, faith, by the same Spirit. And to another, gift of healing, by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, the prophecy. To another, the ability to judge between spirits. To another, the ability to speak in different kinds of tongues. And to yet another, the ability to interpret tongues. <coughs> one and the same Spirit is at work in all these things, distributing to each person as he chooses. For just as the body is one that has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, constitute one body, so it is with the Messiah. For it, is, for it was by one Spirit that we were all baptised into one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. So there Paul's talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, and that's something I'm going to touch on. But I also want to speak about the fruit of the Spirit. So if we go to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. So it's Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility and self-control and there is nothing in the law that stands against such things moreover those who belong to the Messiah Jesus have put their old nature to death on the, on the cross along with its passions and desires since it is through the spirit that we have life let it also be through the spirit that we order our lives day by day So, well, I, I'd like to talk about the Holy Spirit today. Uh, I've known him for around 40 years, and I met him first when I met Jesus. He's stuck with me through good times and bad times, and some truly dreadful times. He's helped me, he's encouraged me, he's shown me the way to go, and he's comforted me when I needed it. He's a very important person to me, and without him I'd be in a real mess. His name is Holy Spirit, and he's one of the three persons of God who make up the Holy Trinity. So that's God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is also known by other names, names that reflect his character and how he works in our lives. He's a comforter. He's the paraclete, and that's a Greek word for one who comes alongside. He's the dunamis of God, the one who moves in power. And that's another Greek word, and that's the word for which we get dynamo and dynamite. And trust me, the Holy Spirit can be both. So I'll give, give the first testimony now about the Holy Spirit's power. The Holy Spirit gives us his power when we're in difficult or even dangerous situations. 
In the book of Ephesians, the Bible tells us that if we belong to Jesus, the same mighty power of God that raised Jesus from the dead is also at work in us. And we're therefore seated with Jesus in the heavenly realms, far above all the other powers in heaven and on the earth. And some years ago, uh, I bought a second-hand keyboard from a music shop in Hampton West, and I uh, bought it to use worship, and it was a, a good solid one that would last many years. So I brought it home, and uh, we used it for a ladies' prayer meeting in the house uh, on the first day, and then the next day we used it again, which was for our home group meeting in the evening. And after the worship time, one of my school-aged daughters came into the room as we were praying. And I just had a feeling that we should pray for her. So I asked her if she'd like some prayer, but she said no. And later on in the evening, she came back in. And again, I had that inner sense that we should pray for her. And so I asked her, and again, she said no, thank you. So, okay, I left it. And I also had a funny feeling that God was trying to draw my attention to the keyboard and that this was somehow connected to praying for my daughter. But I didn't really understand too well how the Holy Spirit works, so I just put it off. I thought, oh, it's just a silly thought. I just uh, ignored it. So uh, we finished the meeting and then everybody went home and then the family went to bed. And my daughter's bedroom was directly above the living room where the keyboard was kept. And in the middle of the night, I was woken up by her calling out, and, and she was obviously really distressed. So I thought that she was just having a bad dream. Uh, and I got up and I went into her bedroom. Uh, I just came in to make sure she was all right. So I turned the light on, and I could see her in bed, and she was really frightened. And she was pointing at the ceiling, and she could hardly speak. And she was just saying something about the keyboard, the keyboard. And so I looked up at what she was pointing at, uh, and a very strange thing happened. Instead of looking at a white painted ceiling with a light on, all I could see was black. And it was pure black. It was the complete absence of light. And it wasn't just a darkness, it was also a nothingness. It was like an emptiness, like the vacuum of space. And although this darkness had no visible form, I was aware that it had a personality. It had an utterly hateful, destructive personality that was pure evil. And this blackness began to come down from the ceiling and come down onto me. And as it came down, I, could, I was feeling crushed under enormous pressure, as if it was trying to squeeze the life out of me. And I could feel the breath being actually squeezed out of my body. But in an instant, quite Without, it was, it was not for me. I felt the power of the Holy Spirit just explode inside of me, kind of down here, just in my, in my abdomen, below my heart. And I felt the Holy Spirit pushing back on that darkness that was trying to destroy me. And I found myself shouting out, in a, you know, really loudly, in Jesus' name, get out of my house. And I, I just did that action. And as I pointed with my arm and I, I called out the name of Jesus, this, the pressure suddenly lifted and this dark shape just disappeared. And it disappeared out of the room. Uh, and this was a very real demonstration to me of the dunamis, the dynamite power of the Holy Spirit, because it wasn't my strength that, that drove this thing away. It was actually the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the name of Jesus. And since that time, I've never been afraid of the enemy, but I do fight him with caution. And I always uh, fight and pray under God's covering and under God's protection. So I'm not afraid of him, but I'm aware that he, you know, you need to be careful. So after this thing went, I was able to pray with my daughter. I was praying with the rest of my family and all come up to see what the noise was about. And uh, everything calmed down and everyone kind of recovered. And the next day we got up and I was sort of thinking, well, what's going on? And it was definitely something to do with this keyboard that we brought into the house. And um, I think it was a second-hand keyboard, so we don't know who used it and what they used it for. 
but I think it had been used for some very ungodly music, let's say, and it had either been deliberately cursed or because of the ungodly use it had picked up the demon, uh, which was kind of resident in the keyboard. And when we were using that keyboard to worship Jesus, it was like pouring boiling water on this demon, and <laughs> it was obviously very, un very unhappy. Uh, and it was trying to hit back at us. Uh, but by the power of the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, it, didn't, it didn't, wasn't able to do any harm. And I was going to get rid of the keyboard, but my pastor said to me, just pray over it and just put it under the blood of Jesus and it'll be fine. And it was. And we never had any more trouble with it. And the best part of this story is that uh, 10 years later, we gave this keyboard uh, <laughs> to go with a, a, a pallet of aid to a church in Africa. And right now this keyboard is being used by Africans to worship God. So I think that's, uh, that's quite a cool thing that God did. And uh, it always amuses me to think that something that the enemy wanted to use for harm, God has completely turned it around and used it for his worship. And the Holy Spirit is also the breath of God, which in Hebrew is the Ruach. It's, ruach is, is Hebrew for breath or wind. And the Holy Spirit is the one who breathes life into us, both in the natural, in our breathing, in our bodies, and in the spirit. He makes us alive in the spirit, able to live in a relationship with God through the work of Jesus on the cross. And if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't be able to come to Jesus at all because it's only by grace that God calls us to himself. And the Holy Spirit has to start touching us and, and knocking on the door of our life and opening our eyes to see Jesus before we can even come to faith in him. And then that's God's bit, and our bit is to open our eyes and, and say yes to Jesus. Uh, and then Holy, the Holy Spirit comes into us and he actually lives inside of us. And the Holy Spirit is the one who is able to make us see God. And by that I don't necessarily mean to see God with our, with our eyes, just like you and I can see each other. Um, we can see we can see God working, we can see God moving in our lives. Although some people have seen God, and they've seen the resurrected Jesus like Saul on the road to Damascus and John in the book of Revelation. And the Holy Spirit also brings the Bible to life, using it to speak to us as well as to teach us about the kingdom of God. Uh, and John's Gospel, in John's Gospel Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And Jesus describes the Holy Spirit as a spring of living water that bubbles up inside of us. He's also the one who anoints us when God wants us to partner with him and serve him in a particular way. Just as the kings in the Old Testament were anointed and as King Charles was anointed at his coronation recently by pouring oil on their heads, the Holy Spirit pours out the oil of God's anointing on his people. And that pouring out is a sign of being set apart for holy use, being consecrated, and being given power and authority. And that's also true today. When God anoints a man or a woman for a task, he sets them aside for holy use and he gives them his power and authority to do that task. And this anointing oil was used by the priests in the tabernacle and later in the temple. And it was a very precious oil with a beautiful aroma and it was only to be used for holy things only the priests were allowed to use it. You couldn't just make some and slap it on like, like an aftershave. Uh, it, was, it was purely for God's own, own use. And the Holy Spirit gives us different abilities. He gives us, for example, the ability to prophesy. And that's just a word meaning to hear or see things in, in a special way or to speak or do things in a special way which only God can do. Um, it's like God uncovering something for us or telling us something we couldn't otherwise know with just our natural ability. A prophecy could be speaking or singing a message that God wants us to give. It could be a warning or a rebuke, but more likely it would be an encouragement or guidance and words of wisdom. And the Holy Spirit is the one who shows us what God wants us to do and how to walk in the day that God has planned for us. He doesn't just give us information. Very often he will touch us in our hearts as well as in our heads. In fact, the Holy Spirit prefers to speak to our hearts as he is a very relational person. 
He expresses God's love to us through our thoughts and emotions. And he is the one who expresses our, helps us express our love back to God through our worship. For when we worship God, the Holy Spirit is the one who moves in us and gives us that connection to Jesus and to Father God. And the Holy Spirit always points to Jesus and the Father. He never, he never draws attention to himself. And he shows us what is true and what is false. He shows us what is of God and what isn't of God. I, I kind of see it a bit like the x-ray machine at the airport. You might have a suitcase that might look lovely on the outside, an expensive, you know, design and leather case. But put it through the x-ray machine and the contents are revealed. And they might be harmful or illegal things. Or we might have a scruffy old suitcase that's falling apart and held together with sticky tape and string. But inside it's filled with precious and beautiful things. And the things that are hidden are brought into the light, whether they're good things or bad. And the Holy Spirit can convict us in our conscience when we have done or said or even thought things that we shouldn't have. And God gives us a choice to listen and to do something about what he's shown us. Or we can harden our hearts and put our fingers in our ears and just ignore him. And the Holy Spirit is also the one who brings the presence of God. When God comes near to us and shows us something of himself, now, God could do that prophetically, as I mentioned earlier, or by feelings of comfort, of security, of feelings of being held safely in his arms. And sometimes the Holy Spirit comes by joy that just bubbles up from inside of us, even though our circumstances might seem really dark and hopeless. And he gives us peace in our hearts. He can give us freedom from worry, fear and pain. Holy Spirit can give us a knowing inside that we belong to God and that we're loved by Him. It's a witness deep down, knowing it in our knower, as a friend of mine would say. And the Holy Spirit is also one who brings God's healing. And that healing originates in the heart of the Father. And it's um, made available through the work of Jesus on the cross. And then it's brought to us by the Holy Spirit. And that love and that long for healing is what Jesus died to bring us. And he also brings us God's shalom. And that's a Hebrew word for nothing broken, nothing missing. It's true peace, true wholeness, which is God's deepest desire for us. God wants us to know him as a father. He wants us to be right with him through the work of Jesus, our high priest and our king our Lord and our Saviour. God wants us to have deep healing in every area of our body, every area of our being, whether it's sickness, injury, or pain, or whether it's in the area of our soul, whether we've been tormented by fears or unwanted thoughts or painful memories or painful emotions. And Father God wants us to be healed in our spirit as well. If our spirit has been crushed or bruised or defiled by the enemy, and through the Holy Spirit, God's able to heal all of these. And he's able for us to be made whole, whatever our needs may be. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gives his gifts to the body of Christ. He comes to give us these special abilities we need to answer God's call on our lives, or to help us to serve and to bless other people, and to help us have a closer walk with God. And the Holy Spirit gives us gifts like wisdom, knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, gifts of miracles, prophecy, discerning between spirits, and speaking in other languages or tongues. And he also gives us the interpretation of those languages or tongues. And these gifts are given by God, they're not earned. We don't work for them, we don't deserve them. And sometimes they're instantaneous, though most of them require us to choose to use them and by continual use of diligence and patience in developing them, uh, we can grow, they can grow to their full potential. Like uh, like music and worship, for instance, or preaching or, or praying for people, any of those things. We just, as we, as we exercise those gifts, we grow in them. Um, so I'd like to give another testimony now. Uh, 
when I first put my trust in Jesus at age 22, which was a long time ago, I remember asking God to pour out his Holy Spirit on me. And I remember walking home from church and I was praying. I was waiting for God to do something. But I was actually very hurt and disappointed because nothing seemed to happen. And I'd been expecting this wonderful experience of joy and peace and be, even be able to speak in tongues that I read about and heard about. But when nothing happened, it actually made me very sad. And for many years, I even wondered if I was even born again. And around 15 years later, I moved from England to Wales. And I went to a small church that had been started by um, Colin and Janet, friends of mine. And over the months, I came to know Colin particularly well. And he was very kind and very patient with me. And he was very fatherly. And that was important because I'd never actually known my own dad. And their church was different to the ones I'd been to before because in that church they believe that God today still fills us with his spirit, like he, like he did in the, in the Acts of the Apostles. And they believed that he gives us the gifts of the spirit, like tongues and prophecy and healing and miracles. I don't remember an actual time in that church and I asked God to fill me, but I probably did ask and remember that I had actually asked him 15 years ago to fill me with the Spirit. And one Sunday in the church, um, Colin and Janet's home group, um, which I was a part of, we were asked to pray for one of the young ladies in our group called Rio, who was going to go to Brazil on the six-week mission trip. And it was the first time I'd ever really been asked to pray for anybody in church. Um, and so, you know, I, I took the microphone and mumbled a few words and passed the microphone on to the next person. But at the end of the service, Rhea came up to me and she thanked me and she said that my prayer had actually really blessed her because it had spoken encouragement directly about the things that God was calling her to do. And I was actually surprised by that because I thought I'd just prayed the first words that had come into my head. And in that moment, I heard God say to me very clearly in my spirit, you're ready. And I thought, ready for what, Lord? And I, I, yeah, I just didn't know what I was ready for, but apparently I was ready for something. And then two days later, I was taking my lunch break in the, from the factory where I worked. And because the factory was really noisy, I used to take my break in the graveyard nearby. Um, <laughs> so for a bit of peace and quiet. Now, I wouldn't recommend hanging around in graveyards, um, but, but at the time, <laughs> it, it, it was... <laughs> it, was, it was actually quiet and I you know, got that little bit of peace. And I used to like reading the inscriptions on the gravestones and I used to wonder what the people were like when they were alive. And uh, some of the graves were for sailors and sea captains because that, that little town that I was in had once been a thriving seaport. Um, but I read one gravestone and it was for a married couple and they had a quotation from the book of Malachi and it said, They shall be mine, says the Lord, on that day when I make up my jewels. And that was Malachi 3.17. They shall be mine, says the Lord, on that day when I make up my jewels. And I was very moved by that verse, because it speaks about how God on the judgment day will take those precious ones who have loved and obeyed Jesus in this life, and he will set them like jewels in the Jesus crown of glory. And I thought, wow, that was a beautiful expression of, of a Christian's sure hope of resurrection and eternal life with Jesus. And through the cross and the purifying work of the Holy Spirit, God will make us like jewels to give even more beauty to Jesus' crown. And I finished work that day and I cycled 12 miles home. And on the way, uh, as I was coming home, I met Colin and Janet's oldest son, Sam, and he pulled his car over to talk to me, and I could see by his face that something was very wrong. And uh, <clears throat> Sam told me that his dad, Colin, had been hurt in a very serious accident on the farm that he ran, and that he'd been run over by a tractor. And as we were talking, Sam got a call from the hospital 
to say that Colin's injuries were too severe and that he just passed away and died during the operation. And they were trying to save his life. And so I just prayed quickly with Sam and then he drove off to the hospital to be with his family. And I cycled back home in shock and in deep grief over the loss of my friend. And over the following days, I spent time on the farm with Colin's family and with other members of the church and with friends. And I became aware that even through my pain and sadness, the Holy Spirit was alongside and he was comforting me. And I had a deep sorrow, but at the same time, I, I also had a deep joy knowing that Colin was face to face with his best friend. Yeah, he was face to face with his best friend, Jesus. <laughs> and now I remembered about what God had shown me on, about, on the gravestone on that day that Colin died. And God was reminding me that Colin was in heaven and he was now one of those precious jewels of Jesus Christ. And as well as the Holy Spirit carried me, I discovered that he was actually enabling me to comfort and encourage other people who were going through their pain. And God gave me an inner strength that allowed me to keep going, not just under the weight of my own burden, but a strength to help others to carry their burdens. And Colin and Janet had started that church with two neighbours that they led to the Lord, and it had just grown from there. And Colin had been at the very heart of that church. He'd been caring for people with a special gift of God, a God-given love for the people. And that gift of the Holy Spirit was so strong in him. And I believe it had now begun to work through me, and that's why the Lord had told me that I was ready on that Sunday before. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is different to the gifts of the Spirit. It's the character and the nature of God in our lives, and it's often at odds with our fallen human nature. The fruit of the Spirit is something that we grow, like fruit on a tree. And the gifts of the Spirit are a bit like Christmas tree, the gifts around it, you know, they just appear, and there they are. But the gift, the fruit on a tree takes time to grow. Um, and we have to actually choose to make this fruit part of our lives. And when we do, the Holy Spirit enables us to grow up into those things. And he helps us to grow in fruit like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And God has given the Holy Spirit to everyone who's given their life to Jesus. But having the fruit of the Holy Spirit enables us to walk like Jesus walked and live a life that pleases God. And when Jesus was baptised in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, he was identified with us in our humanity and in our need to turn away from the wrong things that we do and our need to love God and obey God. Now Jesus didn't need to be washed clean or repent because he actually never sinned, he never did anything wrong. But he chose to go through baptism to be immersed in water, to lead the way for us. And as he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven like a dove. And the Spirit rested on Jesus, and the Spirit baptised him, or immersed him completely. And the Holy Spirit filled Jesus without limit, and anointed him for his earthly ministry. And Jesus is asking us to be baptised in water, and he also asks us to be filled with the Spirit. And God doesn't have favourites. He wants every believer to be filled with his Spirit to overflowing. He wants every, every believer to, to know him and to, to live out our lives in the way that he's calling us to live. So, I'm just going to open it up for uh, a prayer time now. And if anyone would like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, if you just come to the front and we can pray with you and ask God to do that. Or if anyone is already filled with the Holy Spirit but would like to be refilled and have a topping up of the Holy Spirit, we'd love to pray with you. 
And if you've got any particular need, if you've got um, a health, you know, a health need that you'd like God, to, you'd like us to pray for, that you'd like God to touch, or maybe there's uh, you're going through difficult circumstances, or um, you're struggling with with emotional things or difficulties. Uh, again, we'd love to pray for you.